Okay, yeah, so uh, following a particularly ill-timed um, uh, internet outage there, we'll come back in. Um, so um, the first thing I want to do is just to, to is, is there is that just moment next morning where a newsboy outside Hargrove House um, is, is, you know, uh, touting newspapers um, and uh, says, extra, extra, read all about it. Murderous gang of thieves attempt to steal uh, crown jewels, um, you know, and uh, um, uh, that, that appears to be the headline uh, of the day. Um, um, but yeah, uh, before we go into epilogues proper, um, does anyone have any masks that they marked during the previous night that we will visit before? And everyone was rolling too well. That's, uh... <laughs> Awesome. Cool. So um, with that, we will just do sort of a brief, um, uh, a brief epilogue um, for, for our characters. Um, so um, yeah, um, I will just ask um, if whoever has an idea that they, of something I want to do to go first. And, and like I said, if we want to have any brief like moments between between characters as well, that's, that's also cool. Uh, we don't have to do it purely like uh, narratively um, if, if if you do want to have like, like a last conversation or whatever, that is cool. Though yeah, obviously trying to keep it relatively snappy. Um, but yeah, and this can be again, as, as ever with these sort of things, this can be something that's like in the immediate aftermath uh, sometime later or, uh, or anything else uh, as you see fit. Um, does anyone want to start off a round of epilogues? I can go first if no one else wants to. Um, I think this is this is at least several years later, maybe as much as a decade or so. Um, Ardent is still in Hargrave House. Um, his room is more filled with uh, filled with more books and and the strange objects. Um, and I think we see him getting dressed. I, I think we see him, uh, actually, I think we see him at first uh, exhausted from one of his uh, sessions with the, with the dark entities, uh, naked on the floor. And then he, he gets up, he splashes some water on his face and he gets dressed. And as he pulls his shirt on, we see that he has many, many overlapping scars on his arms uh, from, from um, the sacrifices he has to do to, to the entities to, to use his powers. Um, but he looks quite, uh, quite happy uh, and he goes down the stairs and there are maybe uh, John and or Trixie are there, but there are also other new uh, new members of Hargrave House uh, who he talks to and and uh, they are preparing some new uh, in a new investigation. I can follow up on this. Yeah, awesome. Because you won't see John there. No. Um, two or three days later after this happened at the tower, John is uh, with his child looking at it and saying, well, didn't I argue myself into a corner? Shouldn't sacrifice something that is not yours. Great. Well, there's nothing to it then, right? My dear child, for you to live, I cannot. And um, then he will proceed to take a lot of laudum and stuff and to, per to perform uh, the operation that will give that child his his vocal cords because it will take his own and then he will pull the switch that will well give the child life well this is not this is not purely a scientific physical thing that he does right never was he's always just kidded himself into believing yes this is purely science nothing else could be i mean he's creating life there life needs a heart and when that child comes awake, John will tell it to reach into his chest to take the heart. 
so that it may live. You not say it in words, but uh, somehow you can you can hear like a like a connection between these two. And this will happen. The child does not really have a, a choice about this. This is just John will drop it. That is not too suicidal for any of you. Is that okay? Okay. And uh, the child will then stand there and be rather confused about the state of things. But he will be there at your um, when you come down the stairs, looking less confused. Possibly. Awesome. That's lovely. Thank you very much. And Trixie, how about you? I think we see a scene of um, Trixie having just lost another hand of cards uh, down at um, the opium den. She's been looking for the man in the sun mask for the past few years and has not been able to come across him which is quite a shame because she had secretly kind of hoped that he had some kind of antidote for her own condition, much the way he had for Lord Falkenberg's. She mutters to herself something to the effect of, you know, he was the lucky one when she thinks about Falkenberg's fate. But with no one to talk to or who can fully understand what she's saying, she'll just push the last of her winnings over to the man who is sort of the dealer of, of the game. And she will saddle up her things and head out the door to where there is an upcoming show at uh, perhaps uh, Tavistock Hall even. She has in recent years uh, put together something of a small stage act with the help of a few people she knows from Craymore Gardens and uh, around and about London, people who aren't quite the same as the ones she used to run around with out west, but they're a fine enough substitute as she's likely to find. And uh, I think that um, as the sun begins to set and the rising moon kind of casts a certain familiar glow on her skin. She feels her pulse quicken and her uh, kind of grip on her uh, self sort of tighten a bit, almost instinctively. And she just thinks to herself that uh, she doesn't know exactly what the future holds in store for her, but she's a nomad and a wanderer at heart and they survive no matter where they end up and that's the thing that sustains her that's brilliant thank you very much and thank you everyone um it's been a very very fun uh, series of this I've, I've enjoyed it immensely um i am going to stop uh, recording now but uh, thank you very much everyone